May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Every week in our service here at St. Anne's, we hear a psalm sung by the choir. We listen to a psalm every single week. But because we usually tend to focus on the other scripture readings that we hear, I wonder if we don't notice the psalms as much as we could. Now, I really like psalms. I grew up in that kind of church that loves to teach children to memorize scriptures. And so I memorized loads of psalms when I was a child. And we also sung a lot of praise songs that were taken directly from words of the psalms. Songs like, shout for joy to the Lord or the earth, or um, you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. And so the words of the Psalms kind of get stuck in your brain. People were encouraged to turn to the Psalms to find joy and hope and encouragement and to remember that God is with us and God is faithful and that we should joyfully praise God. But I wonder if you noticed that the words of the psalm that the choir sung this morning sounded quite different from what I've just described. Rather than, you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace, Psalm 130 begins, Out of the depths have I called to you, O Lord, hear my voice. Instead of a joyful assurance of God's faithfulness, it begins with a desperate plea that comes out of the very depths. The psalmist is begging that God would hear their voice. Now, the reason that this psalm sounds so different from the praise songs that I grew up with is because there's actually two main types of psalms found in our scripture psalms of praise and psalms of lament but because the churches i grew up in focused on the joyful psalms i didn't really learn any of the psalms of lament and it fact it wasn't until i went to seminary many years later and i had to write a paper about psalms of lament that i even really noticed that they existed And in seminary, I learned that the Psalms of Lament actually outnumber the Psalms of Praise in our scripture. And I learned that there are two main types of lament psalms, individual laments and communal laments. And the Jewish people would sing through all of these laments together. The the Psalms were kind of their hymn book, and they would use the, the individual laments as part of the regular liturgy and they would use the communal laments for times of national crisis like famine or war. And these lament psalms, they typically follow a particular structure. So they usually begin with a cry out to God for mercy, then a complaint or a pouring out of what the specific circumstances of suffering are. Then there's a plea for God's intervention, for God to act and change their circumstances, and a conclusion which moves into hope and trust that God will act. And sometimes they even finish with praise. So they're typically moving from despair and desperation through lament and grief, ultimately to hope and trust and worship. And although Psalm 130 that we heard this morning is a very short psalm, it still follows this basic structure, beginning with this cry of desperation out of the depths, pleading for God to listen and intervene, and then a reminder that God is faithful, God is merciful ultimately moving to a trust that God will hear and be faithful and redeem God's people. Now, as I 
learnt about this long tradition of communal lament, I started to wonder why the churches that I spent most of my life in only sang happy songs. If God's chosen people had a hymnal where the songs of lament outnumbered the songs of praise, then why were all the songs we sang overwhelmingly happy and upbeat and optimistic? And one reason I think that this stuck with me so much, this wondering, was because of a friend of mine who I will call Emma, who passed away in 2018 after a long illness. Emma went through some incredibly difficult things in her young life. Things like domestic violence, homelessness, very serious physical and mental health problems. And when I met Emma, she was suffering from very serious depression. At around the time that all of this was happening in her life, she became part of the church that I worked with, and she got baptized. And many, many well-meaning people in that church, including me, tried to help her. We prayed and fasted when she was desperately ill in hospital that God would save her life. We prayed God's joy over her. We encouraged her to sing along with happy songs about God changing our circumstances. We encouraged her to engage with mental health services. The church helped her to find housing and enabled custody visits with her children so she could see them regularly. And we took her out for dinner, and we threw her birthday parties, and we tried to make her laugh and to talk about happy topics. And I'm sure we thought we were doing all the right things. But as I learned about Psalms of Lament, I couldn't help but wonder, <clears throat> what if... Instead of making Emma playlists of upbeat worship songs and highlighting inspirational, encouraging Bible verses for her, what if someone had sat down alongside her and helped her to use the words of the Psalms of Lament to express the legitimate pain and deep despair that she was feeling? Words like this. Hear my cry, O God, listen to my prayer. I call to you when my heart is faint. My tears have been my food day and night. I say to God, why have you forgotten me? Why must I walk about mournfully, as with a deadly wound in my body? My soul clings to the dust. My eyes shed streams of tears. Trouble and anguish have come upon me. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye wastes away from grief, my soul and body also. For my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my misery and my bones waste away. With my whole heart I cry, answer me, O God. Look on my misery and rescue me. Give me life according to your promise. Could my friend Emma have used the psalmist's words to express what she didn't have words for? Could they have made a safe place where it was okay to be honest about her pain, where it was okay not to be okay? And what if when she came to worship at her church, as well as joyful praise songs, what if we sang communal laments together and other people lamented with her, alongside her? What if the church helped people express grief instead of trying to cover it up or replace it quickly with joy? The theologian Walter Brueggemann says this about the psalms and songs that we sing. The problem with a hymnody 
that focuses on equilibrium, coherence, and symmetry is that it may deceive and cover over. Life is not always like that. Life is also savagely marked by disequilibrium, incoherence, and unrelieved asymmetry. I began to wonder, if we ignore the Psalms of Lament, are we also ignoring the cries of God's people, people close to us and people all around the world who experience suffering on a daily basis? I think the Psalms of Lament present a challenge to us to weep with those who weep and grieve communally as the worldwide people of God. But I find it really hard to move from acknowledging in theory that lament is important to actually doing the business of groaning with people who are in despair. I don't know about you, but I often think that I am afraid of facing my own pain. And maybe we're afraid that if we allow someone else to express their pain, that it will come out and it will be uncontrollable and we will be overwhelmed. It's hard and I don't know how to do this well. But when we're going through difficult times, maybe these psalms of lament can give us a safe place to engage with our feelings rather than trying to make the pain go away. And in doing so, maybe we can eventually move through the pain and grief to hope, to trust in God, and ultimately into worship. Amen.